All right, guys, so we got to talk about woke capitalism for social justice, because that is what it sounds like. Mr. Adam Poston, who is a Harvard PhD economist that spoke at a Cato Institute conference in which he said some things that can only be described as woke capitalism after hearing uh, him give his opinion on people who disagree with manufacturing jobs being shipped overseas to China and what is called the China shock, basically the rise of Chinese exports and the effect that that had on jobs in the US and Europe. So this guy had the wokest take possible in regards to people who are opposed to some of these ultra free trade policies that has devastated parts of this country that used to be manufacturing hubs, namely middle America. He says that people who want to protect jobs, okay, who want to protect manufacturing jobs, good paying jobs for working class Americans, um, they have a fetish for keeping dumb white men in power. I'm sure I'm going to piss off both left and, left and right, so I apologize. Um, that the fetish for manufacturing is part of the general fetish for keeping white males of low education um, outside the cities in the powerful positions they're in in the U.S. And um, that is really what's going on here. Because when you look at the costs of manufacturing, and Susan Hausman and her co-authors have done a lot, not of manufacturing, of trade, and job displacement and community. Susan Hessman and her co-authors have done a lot of work on this, and I'm sure she'll have a different view than I do. But when I look at the so-called costs of the China shock or the costs of the decline in manufacturing, I always think compared to what? For decades, there was enormous, displace, enormous displacement of African Americans in this economy. Every time there was a recession, African American unemployment rates shot up much faster and higher than white unemployment. Single women were methodically excluded from the workforce, and especially if they became parents, or ghettoed in particular sets of jobs throughout the economy well through the 70s into the 80s. Um, displacements on large scales would happen when technology or trade broke through, like all the secretaries who got replaced by personal computers and other forms of office animation. Uh, excuse me, not animation, automation, excuse me. Um, and these kinds of churn, as the economists put it, never were decried. They never got political attention. They never got much notice. But when it started being the white male manufacturing people in the so-called heartland, which by definition was not urban, um, then suddenly this was a crisis. Yeah, so as a uh, black male who is not from the urban inner city, right? Again, it always amazes me how these white and i'm assuming to be here neoliberal right elites that that's what this guy sounds like um how they just assume that again all black people must come from the city none of them live in the country right i mean i grew up literally waking up every single day to to cotton fields right you know um in hall farms okay that is how i grew up right i'm a black person that's not from the inner city but these people just assume that all black people are from the inner city and according to this guy's logic, because he believes that, all the manufacturing jobs that were devastated from free trade with China, that must have just affected white males, right? White males of low education. Again, deeply offensive on so many levels, and I don't think this guy even realized that it's not just offensive to white males to say that, well, if you're opposed to us shipping good paying jobs overseas, that means you're a low educated white male that just wants to remain in power, AKA you're racist. What he's also again implying is that manufacturing jobs did not belong to black people or black people did not have manufacturing jobs, which is just objectively wrong, right? You're just wrong, okay? Because there are studies out there uh, that have studied the impact of uh, the China trade shock on black workers. In fact, let, let's read a little bit here so that you guys know I'm not just making this up. Uh, let, let's read a little bit because again, apparently this guy hasn't read this. He doesn't <laughs> understand this. Okay, let, let, let's read this. An existing analysis from um, the author's name, I'm not going to pronounce, 
on what is commonly referred to as the China shock or the impact of increasing China imports to the U.S. examines the effects of trade on U.S. workers. The study finds that the increase in net imports with China caused significant reductions in U.S. manufacturing employment. The authors estimated 2 to 2.4 million net job losses as a result of the rise in import competition from China between 1999 and 2011 and a decline in manufacturing jobs from 17.2 million to 11.4 million over the same time period, representing a 34% decrease. While this work provides thorough analysis on the impact of trade on industry and local label market levels, the lack of disaggregated analysis masks important variations among racial groups. Additionally, research, additional research from name I'm not going to pronounce here in Bond finds that in the 1970s, black men who worked in the manufacturing industry were negatively impacted by our trade policies with Japan. The research finds that increased import competition with Japan, decreased manufacturing employment, increased labor force non-participation, and decreased medium household earnings for black men. A new analysis from the Public Citizen finds that black and, Lat and Latino, this is Latinx. Obviously, again, this is coming from a woke perspective here, but hey, these are just the facts. Workers have suffered disproportionately as a result of trade policies. This analysis concludes that black workers lost nearly half a million manufacturing jobs during the NAFTA WTO era. They also find that black and Latino workers were both overrepresented relative to their share of the total workforce in nine of the 10 most trade impacted sectors. So again, here we are. Take the wokeness out of it. Basically, what it's saying is that, yeah, in fact, black workers, Latino workers, right? Basically, everybody was affected by this, right? Everybody lost their jobs, which brings me to the point in this video. This is how the elite divide and conquer us, guys. Basically, what this guy's arguing, he's saying, look, if you're against shipping good paying jobs overseas, you're racist. You're racist, right? So these people, the woke capitalists, are using social justice to distract from economic justice. Because we know the far left woke revolutionaries, they, they want both. They want social justice and economic justice, right? They want socialism. Okay, but the reality is that the woke capitalists, they don't even want social justice, right? Because as I just pointed out, all workers across all racial groups were affected by this. Okay, not just white middle America. Everybody was affected by this. But no, 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 let's use racial rhetoric to divide and conquer. Let's use racial rhetoric in order to promote and to push policies that are going to hurt everyday working class Americans to take away their good job and ultimately benefit big corporate America and the rich elite, right? The, the rich elite, the rich woke capitalists like this guy right here, okay? Again, this is why Trump, right? He bucked the Republican Party, right, in 2016 in regards to, uh, you know, traditional conservative orthodoxy, economic orthodoxy in regards to free trade. And he basically came out here and was like, look, shipping our jobs overseas was wrong. Shipping them to China was wrong. And that's part of the reason why Trump is so popular. It's because of his economic populism, which is something I think Trump needs to embrace. Okay, he needs to get back to what he was in 2016 rather than what he is right now. I think that that would actually help him. Okay, if he's trying to run for president in 2024. But again, that is one of the reasons why Trump has become so popular is because he's focusing on the forgotten people, right? Middle America, which again is not just whites, right? It's everybody. The people who work these good jobs that actually built things, okay? That were the backbone of society that got screwed over by, again, Wall Street and the elites and the politicians. Yeah, again, I told you guys, I love capitalism, but I don't like woke capitalism. I don't like capitalism at the expense of the working class. I don't like capitalism at the expense of children i.e what's going on with the whole you know gender thing right um that's why i say on my twitter i'm a common sense capitalist okay in the sense that i believe in capitalism that works for those in our society that are the hardest working among us okay mainly the middle class the people that build things 
that are the backbone of our society. Okay. But again, what the, you know, rich elite, okay, some of these Wall Street types, they're just worried about enriching themselves, right? They're just worried about overall GDP growth, right? Which again, you know, when it comes to the conversation about free trade, there definitely benefits to free trade in the sense that, yes, it does help the country overall economically, okay, to have free trade, right, from a GDP perspective, but from a perspective of it costing jobs, jobs being shipped overseas, good paying jobs for the average American worker, yeah, it's not necessarily a great thing for them. This is why I believe in fair trade, right? In the sense that you can't ship those jobs overseas without figuring out how you're going to replace those jobs, okay? And see, the reality is, is that, you know, if you come from a town like I did, right, a small town that was once filled with small businesses and you watched over time, these businesses go out of business, they go away, these small towns become devastated. Again, you know the effect that this had on regular normal people, working class folks. Again, it's terrible. But again, guys like this don't care. They say, well, if you're opposed to this, then you're racist. Which again, is, is meant to steer the conversation away from what he's saying, which is that, hey, you know, I'm totally fine with sending good American jobs to China. I'm totally fine with that. It, it now steers the conversation to be about race. And now it becomes, again, divide and conquer. I mean, this is generally the playbook. He's just been more overt about it, right? This is what the mainstream liberal media does. This is what the politicians do. This is what they all do, right? They want us fighting each other about race, going back and forth with each other about race, about sexuality, about gender. They want us going back and forth about all this stuff, things that are meant to distract and to divide, right? That's why they keep throwing it in our face, right? That's why they want to keep pushing, you know, LGBTQ in schools. They want to put pride everywhere. It needs to be everywhere. We need to push, you know, social justice, you know, in, in, in the race conversation. We need to push that every single day. We need to be talking about it all the time because that distracts from the real issue. But again, these people, they hate the working class. And again, it's sentiments like this that come from guys like this that show you that they, in fact, do hate the working class. They hate you so much that they, they want to take your jobs away, Right. That, that's what they want. And then they'll tell you that if you're opposed to it, then you're some type of flaming racist, right? You're flaming racist and you have a fetish for dumb white men who just want to maintain power. Yeah, deeply offensive to everybody, right? To everybody. So let me know what you guys think. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Most importantly, share a black conservative perspective. Peace.